welcome back to the Millionaire Choice Show. And I'm going to tell you, we're going to have a lot of energy on this show. I love bringing energy into the show for you future millionaires that are listening. And uh, we got to, we're going to have a real treat today. We've got Cameron and Anthony of the Infinite Wealth Podcast. We're going to talk about infinite banking. We've talked about that a few times on the show, but we're going to go into it in a whole new way today. And I'm, gonna, I'm really excited about what these guys have to share with you and uh, some of the conversations we're going to have. It's going to be a lot of fun. So welcome to the show, Cameron and Anthony. Thanks, Tony. Appreciate you having us. Tony, thanks for having us. And you know what I really like is the name, the Millionaire Choice, because I do believe it's a choice where you want to be, wh whether it's dollars or relationships or whatever you want to be, you can. You just you have to choose it and then take action. So I, I love what, what what you're doing, Tony. Well, thanks. Yeah, I, I think when I was 25, I think the reason I came up with that is because you know, I did make a choice and it was, I didn't want to be broke anymore. Right. And I think there are a lot of people out there that are making, they're not making a choice, you know, and by not making a good choice, they're by definition making a bad choice, even mm -hmm. though they're not consciously making that choice. They're kind of, they kind of are. And, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun helping people out. So now you guys grew up like me, right? You grew up in kind of like the broke, the broke family, um, yeah. and, and had your struggle. So, you know, tell us about that a little bit, because I love how those stories really inspire people, because I think is, is people that don't have wealth, they kind of make excuses on why they don't have wealth. And, and I think by sharing our stories, you have to take a real hard look in the mirror to go, Hey, you know, Cameron and Anthony are really no different than me. And they did it. Why can't I do it? And that's why I love the story, but Cameron, man, tell us about your past and how you grew up. Yeah, absolutely, man. I had the, I was fortunate enough to grow up in North Idaho, grew up in Coeur d'Alene, man. It's one of the most beautiful places in the country, but, uh, I had a great family. Uh, they split up, uh, my parents divorced when I was six years in sixth grade and, uh, my sisters lived with my dad. I lived with my mom. And so, uh, right. And there just wasn't a lot of money to go around. And, uh, that was kind of how we got by is, uh, I remember growing up in high school and, just working, man. You did sports and everything else. And then after that, you went to your job and just to kind of have a little extra there. But uh, you were talking about kind of the choice and the mindset and stuff. And uh, it, it brought me back, man. It, uh, I remember distinctly thinking that uh, I need to make a change. And it was after I'd graduated high school. I was in college and I was working at UPS. Mm. And I would work from two in the morning to 8 30 in the morning loading the ups trucks and then i'd go to college and uh, i go to school during the day but uh, i remember one day like that ups job was the most sought after job up there because it was about 12 13 bucks an hour and it had benefits and i remember standing there one day and one of the guys looked over at me and he's like you know what one day this could be yours right he was talking about his route right the, the route that he had and i remember just thinking holy crap get me out of here and that was really what kind of set me down this road of just kind of figuring out, hey, man, I got to I got to make a, a better life for myself here. <clears throat> yeah, you know, it's interesting you talk about UPS because I had two different truck jobs when I was uh, or freight jobs when I was in college. And uh, the first one was uh, working for a company called PIE Freight that uh, they were actually shut down their their base here. And a lot of people were calling in sick. It was a union. So they didn't want to show up for work. They were losing their jobs. So they weren't really working with the system. And I came in. Yes, I was a scab. I got in and, and I got, uh, I, had a, I had a friend of mine that I went to high school with her dad worked there and, and, uh, he, he, he let me know that I shouldn't be there, but, and then, uh, you know, RPS freight, but yeah, but the AM, I would go in there now, but I, I didn't get as many dollars as you got because I would go in at two, like two 30 in the morning, work till four 30. They would mm. only give me two hours of work a night for like, it's like seven bucks an hour. That's and brutal. I did, yeah, I did it for a little while. I'm like, yeah, I can make more money, you know, working eight hour days somewhere else. So I, I yeah. jetted out of that. Now, you're what one thing that's very interesting is when you mentioned the guy that said this could be yours. And I want to talk about that just for a second. We'll explore it more in the show. But vision, like financial vision or a vision for your life. And what I find a lot of people that are stuck, you know, 70 over 70 percent of people are living paycheck to paycheck. And it's really because they don't have a vision for their future. They don't have a vision on what the possibilities are. And, uh, and I think for somebody that makes the shift from that, that lifestyle, that broke lifestyle, it's because they're latching on to a new vision. Is that what kind of happened to you? That transition? A great point is the vision I had was actually scared the hell out of me, right? It's because I saw what this guy had stand there for hours on end day after day, you know, kind of the financial situation that he's in, but also the physical situation mm. health wise, as you look at 
you know, the, the guys that work there for that long is their backs are shot, their knees are shot from getting in and out of those things. And they're just overall, they're just not very healthy. But uh, so that was really what motivated me as a more of a scare tactic at that point. And to be honest, Tony, it wasn't until years later that I kind of had a vision of what I wanted to pursue kind of as excitement and uh, wanting to pursue something. That wasn't until I moved down to Las Vegas and uh, I saw some opportunities kind of in the physical therapy field of somebody owning their own practice. And that's what got me excited at kind of running my own business and those things. And so it wasn't until years later that I had a, more of a clarity on, on exactly what I wanted. I just knew at that moment, that is not what I wanted. <laughs> Scared. I guess that's the motivation too, by itself, right? I don't want this. And, uh, you know, I kind of saw, I guess that would be kind of how I was set up. Cause I was 16 grand in debt going, I'm broke. I don't want that. You give me something new. And yeah. And I it, think that's a common motivator. Yeah. I mean, and now looking back at it, really what I saw growing up is I, you know, not to be derogatory in any way, but I saw a whole bunch of W2 opportunities and that was all that was available to me at the time. And so people clocking in and clocking out and that was not the mindset that I had. And so it wasn't until I kind of uh, moved out of that uh, city until I saw some business owners and thinking, man, this is something, right? I want to, I want to own my own business. I want to build something here. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. It took me a little bit longer to get past the paycheck uh, mindset, but I did, I did want to manage my paycheck better, but uh, yeah. Anthony, man, what, what was your past look like? How'd you grow up? Well, I grew up, my, my parents divorced before my first birthday. So, and my dad really wasn't in the picture which is kind of ironic now because he, he turned out to be wealthy and he turned and he was an accountant, which I later uh, uh, became a uh, CPA. But so I was raised by a single mother with two kids, zero financial education. Uh, I, I guess maybe formal education, but cause I did learn a lot. Yeah. I learned if I wanted something, I was going to have to get it myself. So I worked, I worked in the cafeteria in uh, eighth grade, made $3 uh, an hour. Nice. Um, and I did a paper boy. And then as soon as I turned 16, I got a job ironically at Miller's outpost. Mm. We, we talked about that in the pre-show. I don't think we put <laughs> that together, which is where I actually met, met my wife, but um, I was still broke in high school. So I went in the military in part to pay for my education, but also I needed to grow up. And when I got out of college, I mean, then I went to college, I got a degree in accounting, worked for Price Waterhouse Coopers, was a CFO for a chain of restaurants. And eventually, but then I realized I wanted something more than a W-2. So one thing they talked about is starting your own business. So I started, um, I started my own uh, CPA firm, which was great, you know, but I, t I never worked so hard <laughs> with it, it, until I was working for myself. You know, now I'm the owner, it's all on me. And I had to do all these things. But what I realized what I was doing, at least in the CPA world, I was exchanging my time for money, right? Okay. If I do this for an hour, you're going to give me this, but and, and really to create those billable hours, I had to work almost 1.5 to two hours to be able to bill one, meaning there's time that you can't bill for, or you got to do research or all these other things. And I kind of realized something I, I was, I was making a good living as long as I was working, right? If I wasn't working, I wasn't making money. And then what really hit me was the, the crash in 2008. That's when I realized that people who were doing everything that they were told to do, let's pay off my house, let's stay out of debt, let's max out my 401k, to no fault of their own, they might have lost their job. The equity in their house was cut in half, their 401k cut in half. And I saw people struggling there. And it, it actually scared me because I noticed I was doing the same thing they were doing. So that's what, that's what allowed me. I, I'd say like, that's what it took my blinders off. Cause back then I was very passive. I had a financial planner, right? I'm like, here you go. Here's my money each month. Okay. I'm going to come back when I'm 59 and a half and let's, let's hope it's there. 
but I kind of realized that that model to get where I wanted to be, I was going to have to be more active. And I noticed that some few of my clients did very well in 07 through 09. And so I started approaching them. How are you in this mindset? Everybody else is doing the more typical financial planning and they don't have the money to buy, buy this house. You bought my neighbor's house for 50 cents in the dollar, right? What books are you reading? You know, what kind of, I, cause I knew it was about mindset. And then that really kind of opened my eyes to that, to get what I wanted, just like a choice, right? I had to make a choice and put in some work to, to achieve the lifestyle that I wanted, not just for me, but also for my kids. I want them, they need to have a little struggle because I think partly what, what we went through growing <laughs> up, creating that struggle and that grit, I think is very important. Yeah. I, but I, totally I don't want them to have you. to work as hard as I did. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, uh, I'm kind of curious, like when you were in the military, were you uh, supporting your mom some, like sending money home to help out with the house and the family? Or were you able to kind of start, you know, putting it back? I'd sound more noble if I said I was, but uh, I, I was at that point, my my mom had the two kids out of the house, so she was doing okay. So yeah, yeah. She, uh, you weren't a burden to her anymore. The reason I ask is because you know my mom and dad both grew up in broken homes too, like both of you guys grew up, and I did. not You know my parents stayed married until my mom passed away a few years ago, but I I never experienced that side of things. But I I got to see and hear the stories of how difficult it was, you know, for my grandmother to raise, uh, four kids, five kids, I'm sorry, five kids as a single mom. And I won't mm -hmm. even begin to share the stories about my grandfather, but, and then my uncle, my oldest uncle was actually sending money home to support my grandmother and the four kids like to help out as he could. So I just wondered if, uh, if that was, you know, your story. And then my dad, uh, dropped out of school in, uh, my mom always told me ninth grade, but we found a yearbook online with him in 10th grade. So I think it was actually 10th grade that he dropped <laughs> he shut out up for picture day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and he, he had to drop out and support himself because he didn't get any family support growing up. And, and, uh, you know, and then he's been, you know, a faithful provider for the family all these years. And, uh, but the stories are, it's just so much more difficult, right? So to have respect for your, you know, your mom and dad's single parent household is just very, very difficult. I've got six kids. And, uh, you know, I'm trying to figure that out, right? How do you transition kids? Like I learned this stuff at 25 and been learning yeah. for 25 years, but this year I started stepping in actually last year, stepping in to go, okay, I, they know they're not very, um, uh, they're not very wasteful. Like they're very frugal. They don't spend a lot of money on things, but they also don't have a lot of ambition to go build wealth yet. So I'm like, okay, they get the, the basics down. They're not going to get into trouble with their finances, but how do I help them understand what the, the ceiling is or the possibilities are. And so we started making investments for a couple of my sons uh, last nice. year, they made their first investments. And oh, now cool. I've got my, I've got my 10 year old talking about being uh, the first millionaire kid in the family. Nice. And, uh, oh, I yeah. like that. Yeah. yeah. And he's actually, he's actually started looking at cryptocurrencies and stuff at 10 years old. So we're, you know, looking at that, playing with that a little bit, but yeah. And just, but getting them to understand that, you know, the possibilities and, and transferring those principles, it's a, uh, it's especially for a first generation millionaire, like me and my family, it's like, how do you, you know, make that work? So real quick story. I think I told you guys in the pre-show, I'm moving down to a new house mm -hmm. and uh, we're on a tight timeline. Cause we need to, you know, sell the house we're in move into that yeah. one, but it's a fixer upper. And so we've got, it's a two floor house. We've got the first floor, uh, pr almost done. I'm actually doing the hardwoods myself, laying the hardwoods. Mm. I'm son of a carpenter. So I do that stuff, Good but the downstairs isn't going to be ready, uh, as soon as I would like. So um, I'm talking to my wife about maybe we should just move in with it unfinished and let the kids experience a little bit of hardship. You know, <laughs> they, they've had it, uh, pretty easy. You know, they haven't suffered for anything. They've had it a lot better than we did and, and they can take a lot of things for granted. So we may move them in there with unfinished and unpainted walls and, and, uh, let them live like that for a little bit while we finish it out ourselves and, and engage them in the process. Um, I haven't decided for sure if we're going to do that or not, but I dig it real quick. How old are the, how old are the kids? Ages, uh, ages. Age is 10 up to 21. So I got three boys okay. and three girls. Yeah. And uh, I was going to say anything under 10, they probably might enjoy the chaos. Right. But, uh, <laughs> The older teenagers, right? They need some luxury. 
Yeah, I think the girls, as long as they have a decent shower to, you know, to clean up and look good when they go out, they're, they're probably yeah. all right. Yeah, but, mm-hmm. but I mean, you know, when you think about it, uh, there are so many people that are just really struggling in the U.S. Mm-hmm. I'm sure you guys faced your own family struggles. Uh, you know, we did. We had our water cut off, our power cut off growing up. Mom and dad yeah. bounced checks. Uh, couldn't pay bills. Uh, my parents sacrificed and sent me to private school. But there were years we were literally two years behind in tuition at a private school. And uh, and the, the principal, I don't even know what happened with that. I don't know if they, I think he just wrote it off uh, just out of generosity to my parents. But, um, you know, it created a lot of difficulties, you know, just mentally, emotionally to, to be different than all the other kids that were in school there. And, uh, you know, what was that jacket you were talking about, Cameron, when uh, you were shopping with your mom and trying to get her to figure out? Yeah, the, 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 was it the jacket from the michael jackson thriller video <laughs> uh, no man I, I i remembered it was uh we were down in southern california we we're talking about this before we start the show but uh right is how i would never ask for stuff as i knew the situation that we're in even as a young kid and i would never ask for anything i would just go and stand by stuff and just hope that my mom would ask if i wanted it right and uh, i was just sharing the story about uh, me being in southern california at a miller's outpost and standing next to this jacket and it was a, br- a gray kind of nothing fancy, just a gray kind of heavier winter jacket. And uh, man, we lived in Idaho and I was like, dude, that looks good. That looks real good. So I just stood there for probably 20 minutes while she went around the store, just waiting for her to come back. But uh, anyways, yeah, you know, you, one of those things, you just kind of know the situation, you know, that's not there. So you don't ask and just kind of hope. But yeah, we had, uh, I think leather jackets were a big one, blue jean jackets when I was in school and uh, Izod, Izod was a big one. Oh, yeah. Izod, yeah. Yeah, and everybody's wearing Izod. And then uh, I remember for myself the story, uh, you know, when I played sports and the, the Letterman jackets came out and they, the school, obviously, they use that as a money making opportunity mm-hmm. at some level. And uh, all the all the kids on the team got the official Letterman jackets. And my parents were like, hey, we can't afford that. Um, you know, I think the jackets were like 200 bucks or something. Yeah. And we went out and, uh, and we got like, I think a 69 or 89, $80 jacket that was the same colors, just a different brand uh, and then had yeah. our own letter. So it didn't match. It was the only jacket in the whole school that didn't match. And, you know, and it was always that, you know, playing on the basketball team, uh, the, all the kids on the team had uh, Nike Air Jordans. They were red and white. I was wearing the pro wings. So I was always mm-hmm. the guy. And I still remember the coaches, man, the, once they saw my stuff, they just roll their eyes and I'm, you know, I'm 50 years old, still remembering that stuff. It affects you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah totally. So you guys uh, broke free from that. And then you started on your own wealth journeys. Uh, how long ago did that start for both of you guys? How many years? Man, I would say I, well, I'm 41 right now. And I can't, I really started getting passionate uh, when I moved down here to Las Vegas, I was late twenties at the time. And uh, I'd started a business uh, was my scenario. And uh, man, I started making some pretty good money and I was started to accumulate some cash and I was looking at places to put that money. And uh, I didn't have an HR department, right? I mean, I was just a small business owner at that point and I didn't have anybody to kind of tell me what to do. So what I did is I just started researching and started looking on different places where I could find it. And you know, my story was that everywhere I looked, it kind of had the same idea as put your money away to your 60, 59 and a half. And for whatever reason, right. That just never made sense to me is I always want access and control to my, of my money. And so I didn't do anything. And then I came across the infinite banking strategy, uh, about 27, 28 years old. And, uh, man, that one just really spoke to me just as far as being able to put money away, still have access, still be able to use it. And so, that's really what kind of got me passionate about this. And I started doing it with my own money. And then I started sharing this strategy with other business owners that I knew. And that's really what pulled me into the industry. It wasn't, I didn't set out to be an advisor or have any intentions of doing that. It was really just uh, coming across a strategy or two and, uh, you know, if utilizing it success, successfully and sharing it with others. <clears throat> so now, now, Cameron, what? on top of that, like you're talking about, like the idea of putting money away is so am i hearing you say that you don't have any equities right now you've got your money in different things is that what i'm hearing you say as part of that That, that's exactly correct yeah so i i don't have 401ks iras i don't put money any money in the stock market anything like that is uh everything that i've got is inside of an insurance policy 
And then what I do to uh, purchase assets is I will take a loan against that cash value and then I'll go take a, uh, you know, I'll go and buy it then. So I've done a, a multitude of investments just based solely from the cash value. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Let's talk about that some more after we get through the stories. Yeah. So what about you, Anthony? When did you kind of shift? I think you said about 12 years ago, right? It was like about a couple of days before Cameron <laughs> saw the light, <laughs> but, uh, well, Cameron and I are like uh, brothers where we're always kind of making fun of each other. Uh, but as I said earlier, it was, it was after the crash of 08 that I had an awakening and that really opened up my eyes. And I, like, as we talked a little bit earlier, there's a lot of ways to build wealth and to achieve your goals. Right. I mean, for me, I wasn't a big fan of wall street. Uh, and, and I know when some people could say that, we have missed out over the last couple of years, but what we do is we invest in things we know, you know, I, I'm not, we're not speculative where maybe this will go up. I want to invest in real assets and partly we follow a lot of Robert Kiyosaki and we, real assets have an asset backing it up. So what we've, and kind of when I'm looking at the people that have made money, have been wealthy, n didn't make it in their 401k. It was because they, they either owned a business or real estate. And I wanted to get with financial freedom, like with Robert Kiyosaki's definition is your passive income is more than your monthly expenses. And so that's what I've, that is my goal is to have that financial freedom and very difficult to do that in, in equities. You can, but I'm investing in things that I know, whether that's real estate in my business. And I know you've had uh, the land geek on your show. We've been doing that for over a year. And not only are we making passive income and create a business, Kind of, Tony, what you talked about is getting the family involved. What, what we did is we created an LLC. I mean, my kids are a little older. I mean, so they're 22 and 28. So we, all uh, the three of us put in money in this LLC and we all work this business. And part of the reason why I wanted to do it was to create some passive income, but really more importantly with the bigger picture just so we talked about, we need to teach that other generation about money. The best way for somebody to learn is for them to do. So we have our kids actively working in, in the business. And now that, and so now they're doing that with me as a guide, but the goal is for them to learn to do that without me. Mm -hmm. And now my, we're teaching our kids an entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, and, you know, my daughter just graduated college and her goal is to not have a traditional job. And she's 22. Her overhead is the lowest <laughs> it's ever going to be. Yes. Right? Now's the you got the energy. She's got some money that she's been saving. Now's the time to let's start a business. So my son and her are, are going to start a, uh, a business with uh, doing short-term rentals with, uh, with Airbnb. And I'm actually closing on a rental property, ironically, in Tennessee. It's in Memphis. Uh, and I'm going in halvesies with my daughter. That's so fun. now, so she's going to be able to see, she's going to see the rewards of real estate, but I also want her to see the risks. Right. Because doing anything, there's pros and cons, but by doing something with our kids, we can give them some protection of the downside and also kind of allow them, allow them to learn. Like I want them to stumble. I mean, I learned in part because I didn't have and I needed to pick, I needed to pick myself up. And so we're trying to teach that with, uh, with our kids now. Yeah, I love what you're saying there. It's, it's very interesting. My wife and I are having those conversations because she grew up, you know, in Wyoming. It was Idaho, so she didn't grow up with potatoes. She grew up with uh, Broncos and horses, right? <laughs> yeah. But uh, it's it, and she's first generation too. So like the idea of becoming wealthy for her, she's like, I never imagined 
that because that's not how I grew up. Her dad was a police officer and her mom worked on the railroad. And then her original family came from Indiana, which is all farmland. And so they all are, are family farm owners, uh, you know, 400, 500 acre farms up there. But the whole mindset of, of having wealth, and I think I'm in the same place you are, Anthony, of going, okay, um, if we're the patriarchs of our family, along with the matriarch, like, you know, my parents, my mom and dad and my aunt, my um, uncles, and they didn't really function as patriarchs and matriarchs for the well-being of the family. That's just not how people yeah. that come from where you guys came from and I came from, that's not how they think. But you roll up into the higher levels of society. I hate to say it that way, but, you know, the, the more wealthy. And they do think that way. They're like, okay, you know, you're expected or you have access to thinking of wealth and thinking of business. It's, it's just a different environment. And, uh, and that's where my best thinking is right now. So I'm going, oh, okay, so I have six children. And whoever my girls marry and whoever the boys marry, we need to think of that as more of a – almost like a, a family corporate unit yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, where all of them are on track to build wealth, but we're building it collectively. Um, and I don't, I don't have that all figured out. This is just newer thinking for me again, being a first generation millionaire, but to go, I need to transfer the principles, but I also need to work and figure out how to work in collaboration uh, with my family so that they grow. My wife made her first uh, investments this year, first ever Ooh, investments. Nice. Yeah. And I, I'm a cryptocurrency trader. Mm -hmm. I've been trading for about three or four years. And uh, she, she looks at me one day, she says, you know, puts like sneakily, she goes, I bought some cryptocurrency. And, <laughs> and I'm like, I think that's wonderful, baby. What did you buy? And uh, because she heard me talking about it. Yeah. just be, And so she decided she was going to go out on a limb and do something different and, uh, and bought a little bit. And um, my other son, we got him some Apple stock, I think, uh, last year before it split. And, you know, his turned into, I, I don't remember, he made maybe doubled his money in the last 12 months or so. But yeah, but teaching those principles and, uh, and, and getting it. And I don't know that, have you guys found any good books for like teaching your own kids? I haven't seen anything really. It's, it's usually like one-to-one, -one, like, uh, you know, like Robert Kiyosaki, Rich Dad, Poor Dad like more aimed at adults, not really transferring it down to uh, a teenager. Well, yeah, we That's do. Right. Yeah. You want to go ahead. Is well, it... have you heard of the Tuttle twins? No, I have not. You have... Is that what you're going to talk about? Uh, no. Okay. Yeah. Right. <laughs> These Tuttle twins, what, what, what they've done is, uh, what's the guy's name? I, I got uh, yeah. Tuttle twins. It's, it's a book series written by Connor Boyock. Uh, B O Y A C K, and the guy is, is phenomenal. But he has uh, been a great proponent of uh, of individual rights, uh, capitalism, I guess. But uh, his books are re -re rewrites of like uh, Mises books and some other uh, very uh, well known barks that are out there. So he's got like the creature from Jekyll Island that's geared towards you know uh, ten to twelve year olds. All right, Go time ahead. out, time out. So like that book, have you guys read that book, Tom, A Creature from Jekyll Island? I've re I've, I haven't read it cover to cover. I've read pieces. Yeah. All right. I think there's like a convergence going on here because I literally I probably talked to three people a week right now that are bringing up that specific book. And it, it came up on my radar two or three years ago and I picked it up, but I haven't finished it yet. It's like reading an encyclopedia, right? On yeah. the history of the Federal Reserve. But I just think it's interesting. Like I, I'm literally talking to people about that specific book all the time. So future millionaires, if you haven't listened to an episode where I've talked about the creature of Jekyll Island, go out, pick up a copy of that book. I don't think you should be playing in the, in the financial system without really understanding mm. how this system works, not just in the US, but worldwide. And so for you guys that don't know, the Federal Reserve Bank and the IRS are not U.S. government institutions. They were set up back during the Great Depression days, and, uh, and it's all part of a system. It's all part of a financial system, and I'll leave it to your imagination on why it was set up the way it was. Uh, but I really encourage you guys, if you're going to be doing any kind of investing, especially in this season with mm -hmm. what's going on in the world economy with our $30 trillion in debt, in U.S. debt, and uh, where the U.S. dollar is probably headed, you owe it to yourself and your family and to your friends and family to uh, read that book and just understand things with a, a deeper level of depth. So, uh, Cameron, uh, resume, man. Resume. I like what you're saying. The Tuttle Twins and their book. 
Tuttle Twins are, are great books, and he's had, I think there's 11 or 12 books that are geared towards uh, kind of adolescence there, and he just came out with another two or three books that are geared towards teenagers. One of them is called How Not to Suck at Life as a Teenager, I think, <laughs> right? But uh, just great information. He's got a bunch of really good content, but uh, man, I've purchased these, and uh, we started reading them to our kids. And uh, what I've done with my son, he's 11 now, is I have him read him, and then I have him give me a report on it. And right. And so it's just repetition, but he's got a, you know, what I think is a very good understanding of kind of the monetary system and how money works. And uh, it's pretty cool to hear him come home and have some conversations about kind of stuff that he hears at school and uh, kind of checks it with what he read in some of these other books. So uh, great information. And, uh, you know, I love what you said a minute ago about kind of talking in terms of money, as far as how, how people, uh, poor versus rich discuss money. And that's one of the things I've found kind of throughout my career is that when you talk in terms of kind of family wealth is it puts a whole nother spin on kind of responsibility and stewardship of somebody's money. And there is a responsibility for us as the patriarchs of our family, right. To have those conversations with our kids about money, because I know my generation didn't, and I was worse off by not having those. And so when you talk to families in terms of, hey, you know what, mom and dad have money, uh, you know what, you're going to do one of two things. You're either going to hand it over to them and teach your kids that mom and dad have money and you can have access to it any time, or you're going to lend it to them in certain scenarios. And you're going to know that mom and dad have money. And under these circumstances, you can have access to it uh, with, the re- with the responsibility of paying it back. And uh, when you talk in terms of family wealth, like I said, it just completely changes the mindset. So uh, I love that point that you made. I just want to touch on that. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing. Uh, have you? So uh, this is me uh, seeking counsel from you. So I, I have, uh, you know, coming into leadership, working in the corporate offices, you had to be responsible for your team and growing people under you and making sure that they improve their skill set and their qualities. And I think as parents, a lot of times uh, we just kind of punt the ball and, and rely on the school system, whether mm-hmm. that's public or private, to uh, grow. And so my parents didn't really challenge me to read a lot of books. Um, I read a lot of fiction books. Uh, I didn't read a lot of nonfiction books growing up. Um, and so with my kids, what I'm trying to do now, and I've tried it, I'd say I false started several times and I'm still trying to figure out like, how do you really get your kids to grab a hold of some of these principles? And, you know, I've tried leadership books go, Hey, I, I want you guys to read these leadership books, or I want you to read this financial material. I gave all of my kids my book <laughs> last summer. I said, Hey, all you guys are going to read my book this summer. And I think I had one kid that maybe got like a third of the way through it. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. And so it's like, as a dad trying to go, okay, what's best practices for getting your kids to, you know, to exercise. Cause you, I'm trying to figure it out. Right. What's the right model. Uh, have you had any luck? Either one of you guys? Yeah, I got some, I, well, I have a unique experience cause I had mentioned I'm a recovering CPA. So one thing I had my son do, I had him do the accounting for the family. I mean, so we, we'd set up in QuickBooks, but you don't need to have QuickBooks. But he, he was the one who reconciled and balanced the checkbook. And that opened up his eyes like, ooh, this private school that you sent me to was... <laughs> was expensive this mortgage we spend how much in food or your auto insurance like that's how because some things books are great for knowledge but you can't get the experience unless unless you do it so he got a good view of where our money went and now to be honest it was hard for me to be so open to him because he saw he saw everything right but we wanted to be, we wanted to be transparent. So that's one thing that, that I've done. Also, again, we're big fans of Robert Kiyosaki and he has the cash flow quadrant. I'm sorry, the, 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 the cash flow game, which is more of a real life monopoly. And the goal is to get your passive income more than your expenses. And what I really liked about this is that the way, and for the listeners who haven't played, basically everybody has an occupation. So you might, one guy's might be a doctor and there might be a truck driver. 
and what, what we're thinking is, well, it's going to be a lot easier for the doctor to get that financial freedom because he has so much money, but he might be making a lot of money. He's also spending a lot of money. So his overhead is high compared to school teacher. And then when you go around and if you have a kid, well, the kid for the school teacher might add maybe 200 bucks to your monthly expenses. But if you're a doctor, it's like 600 a month. So I think what it taught is managing your monthly expenses and focusing on creating that passive income. And what you also do in there is you, part of it is you have to keep your balance sheet. What are your assets? What are your liabilities? What's your expenses? So it's turned it, the doing into a game where it can be a little bit more practical. And another thing that, that is cool on there, like each game has like a spot you, that you don't want to land on, you know, go to straight to jail or with cash flow quadrant is called a doodad. And if you land on that, you pull a doodad card and a doodad could be, oh, well, you bought a big screen TV, subtract $2,000, or you rehabbed your kitchen, or you bought a new car, or, you know, it's kind of all these things, you know, that normally in real life, my son would be like, cool, I bought a new TV. But in the game, he sees a financial impact. Oh, man, that's $2,000. So now that means I can't, I can't buy an investment with that money. So there's also the cash flow game for kids, which is one Cameron uses. So <laughs> that one would be good, Tony. <laughs> That one would be good for your 10 year old, right? But again, we're turning it into a game so we can have fun. And what the way that we do it, again, we try to have an abundance mindset. In Monopoly, it's like you against me, or I got to pay you rent, right? So I don't want you to get the hotel, right? Because we're competing against each other. But in real life, we're not. We should have an abundant mindset. Tony, I want you to do well. I want everybody to do well. So in the cash flow in the cash flow game, we play is we want everybody to do well. We're not trying to to beat the other person. What we're trying to learn uh, from what they're doing. Yeah, Tony, I think I, that's really good info. I was I was just going to share one experience I had and I man, I remember this vividly and this is probably one of my most favorite teaching moments that I've had with my son. He's the oldest. He's 11 now. And this actually happened a couple years ago. His birthday's in May, and I remember I was tucking him into bed one night and just kind of sitting there and talking to him, and I'm asking him what he wanted for his birthday, and he tells me he wanted a Nintendo Switch. So I go, and I look it up, and I forget what the number is, like five, six, seven hundred bucks, whatever it is, right? And I'm like, okay. I'm like, hey, man. I'm like, so what do you think? Like, how much should parents spend on a kid for their birthday, <laughs> right? And he's like, well, I don't know. And we're kind of sitting there, and he's like, yeah, never mind, Dad. He's like, can you just get me this maze game? And I'm look it up. I look up this maze game and it was like $15. And I remember sitting there and I was like, well, what are you doing? Like, no, that's not the message that I want to give this kid. Right. And I was like, Hey man, I was like, let's talk about this for a second. I was like, I need to tell you something. I was like, you can have anything you want in this world. I was like, but you got to go earn it. Nobody's ever going to give it to you. And I said, so if you want this Nintendo switch, You've got to bread value. You've got to use your skill set to go achieve this thing, right? And I said, so we sat there the next 30 minutes, and I'm like, man, tell me some things that you can do. And he's like, well, I can't do nothing. And I'm like, no, <laughs> you can do a lot, right? Like, what can you do? And so we went through, and we ended up coming, with, coming up with like four different uh, things that he can do. Mow the yard, right? Pick up dog poop, clean out trash cans, and I forget what the other one, but we put a prices on these and so I'm like, hey, man, I was like, let me help you. I was like, I'm going to put this thing together in the morning. We'll look at it and we'll, we'll see what we can come up with. So he goes to bed. I, I type up this little thing. And in the morning, we, I made up this little flyer with him and it was called Project Nintendo Switch. And, and on there, it said, hey, my name's Declan. I live down the street, right? I'm from this neighborhood. I'd like to get a, a Nintendo Switch. My dad won't buy it for me. So I'm trying to earn money, right? Then he listed these things. And so we went through, I printed off, you know, 10, 12 of them. And I'm like, all right, man, we come home from school. Let's walk around the neighborhood and we'll hand these out to people. And so the first time we go and we walk around the neighborhood, he's standing in the street. He won't go up anybody's driveway, right? He's scared as can be. 
So I'm like, all right, man, I'll, you know, I'll walk up there. I was like, I need you to at least be close enough so you can hear me talk to these people. Right. So he comes up and stands on the porch and I knock to him, knock him like, Hey, that's my son. I hand it to him. So we go out and I was like, dude, we're not done. I was like, we got to continue to do that. So we went out a couple of days later. This time he comes up to the door with me. The third time I made him go up to the door mm -hmm. by himself. And so he went around. And so then people started texting me, right. As far as, Hey, I'd like to, you know, Declan wants to come and do this. And so by the time we got to Christmas, he had made enough money to buy himself the Nintendo switch. And so what we talked about was a great man, you know, I'm so proud of you. Now for Christmas, how about you ask people to buy you games, which are, you know, 30, 50 bucks instead of the 700 as you know. And so mm -hmm. that right there was one of my favorite teaching moments with just kind of, you know, identifying, man, you know what? You condition your kids by things that you say and the Absolutely. way that you, in the way that you convey it. And you know what? I probably was subjected to some of those conversations as far as, Hey, don't set your goals here, set them down here when I was a kid. And it takes a whole lot for somebody to overcome that. Usually it's, you know, 20, 30 years old or later in life till you realize it. <clears throat> Absolutely. Yeah. I think, you know, it's interesting listening to what you do with your kids. Cause I, I, I was able to get my kids to a point where they were like, dad, I want to start a business. And mm. then I would build flyers for them. Yeah. But then they would not go around and knock on the doors to give the flyers out. You know, one of them was doing uh, lawn care and the other one was doing babysitting or dog care. Another one was going to do uh, home cleaning, uh, all related to their skills that they like to do. Yeah. But I did not go the extra step and walk around with them door to door to get them over that particular, you know, it's a sales, it's a sales trick, right? It's sales training. Yeah. Yeah, to get them over that. So I did not give them the sales training they needed. I gave them the idea or helped them with their idea. And then I helped them with their flyer materials, but I didn't go that extra step. And, and so I need, so you, you showing me up here, Cameron, so, <laughs> on my own show, on my own show too. So. Oh man. Sorry. Well, let's, hey, let's, let's turn the corner real quick. Oh, I had one more thing too. I loved what you said, Anthony, about your son and showing him uh, your, uh, financials. And we've been pretty open with our finances. You know, uh, our, our house is paid off. Uh, we've got the biggest house in this neighborhood. It's got huge, you know, old plantation columns on it. And uh, nice. in our neighborhood, some of the kids that we've referred to have been referred to as the rich people, which I, I don't know about that. But but the kids have had to face that a little bit in our neighborhood, you know, and I'm in a, I'm in a situation, you know, there's there are people out there that teach people to be debt free. I like the term job free. And so mm -hmm. I like teaching yeah. people to be job free instead of just debt free, but they're kind of, you know, playing in the same space, but uh, you know, and I have, you know, I reached my millionaire goal at age 40, but I had another goal that I had forgotten about. And that was to be able to live off of my investments. Mm -hmm. And it just occurred to me like three weeks ago that that's what I've been doing for four years. I've been living off of investments for four years and didn't consciously kind of connect the dots because you're still you know, working on a, a book promotion or working on mm -hmm. a show or things like that. So I'm kind of celebrating a little bit of hitting that goal. But my son, I did not teach my kids how to budget because my kids really didn't want much. So they were very frugal by nature. So I didn't have to manage a budget. But my oldest son, when he went off to college, I, I had this, there was this big disconnect between what college meant financially and I was very, I was very frustrated with that because I knew what it meant because I went to college, but he's going to college for the first time. And I, I think it was about two months before he left for college. I, I sat down and said, look, there's a disconnect and I'm frustrated by it. And I got to get on the same page with you. And I said, I'm going to show you how to do a budget and we're going to do a budget for your first year of college. Mm -hmm. And when he sat down and did that, went through each line item, you know, like two ish and room and board. Uh, expenses, cell phone, like everything, the light bulb really came on for him. And he's like, I wish you would have done this for me when I was 16. And I'm like, well, nobody did it for me when I was 16. <laughs> yeah, <right? laughs> So don't, don't feel too, don't trash me too bad, son. But, but that was a key learning moment for me to go, Hey, you know, uh, that is one of those key things that we need to transfer to our children. And it seems so simple, but because somebody didn't show me that I had to figure it out on my own, then I've kind of followed in that same vein with my kids. It's like, okay, it's, it's not natural yet in our family line. You know, you, you guys and I were talking about being a patriarch of the family. 
what knowledge really needs to be passed on to the children and how do you pass that on so that they can pass it on? That's one of my, my quests, but we got a little bit of time left. Let's spend some time talking about infinite banking. You got, okay. that's what you guys do. <laughs> that's your yeah. specialty. And so yeah. we need to spend some time talking about that. So clear up, let's see if you guys have the best definition of anybody that's ever been on the show uh, for, for the future millionaires listening on what infinite banking is. What is it? Okay. Well, you know, I will say it, it's not that complicated. If you know what it is, we as agents or, I mean, I'm a CPA, so I have a tendency to get very detailed, but it's actually very simple. And what we talk about is somebody wants to invest, right? They want to buy a rental property. And I know this is going to go maybe against maybe, well, let's just go with it, right? But you're going to save up money, right? And let's say you want to buy an asset. We buy the asset we, and we, we drain our account by the asset. But then we want to buy another asset. So we save up money until we have enough for that asset. Then we drain our account and buy another asset, which is great, right? The problem is we're breaking the compound interest curve every time. Like, Tony, at what point w would you want your money to stop compounding? What would you say? Never. Okay. Ne but the, when you're paying cash like that, you're breaking it every single time, right? So what we teach people by using the infinite banking concept, by adding one extra step to buying that investment, you, you, you never break the compound interest curve. And a way that I like to explain it, and we touched a little bit before, Tony, but it's kind of, do you under, may, do you use a rewards credit card or do you at least understand the philosophy behind it? What are you talking about? I haven't had a credit card in 20 years. <laughs> okay. Per, okay, great. But you wonder what a lot of people will do is they use a rewards credit card and because they're going to buy it anyways, right? I mean, in theory, because we talked a little bit, Tony, I, I tried the re rewards credit card many years ago, chasing those points and I, I, I spent more money than I should have because I, I didn't, mm -hmm. I, I wasn't meant, mentally capable of properly managing it. But what the, the point is, you're going to buy this thing anyways, by putting on a rewards credit card, as opposed to paying cash, you get a couple, you get a little bonus. The theory is you're going to buy it anyways, but now I'm going to get some miles. If you can understand that philosophy, you can understand infinite banking. Because what we teach people to do is we want you to buy that asset, whether it's a rental property or equity or crypto or a house or a personal house, whatever it is that, that's going to take capital. And what we do is by, instead of just paying cash, we, we use the infinite banking concept and use a specially designed policy. We use the money from that. And then we go ahead and th then we pay that policy back. So we're still using the same amount of cash, but it is we're just cycling a little bit different. And by doing this, we're still getting the asset. But just like with the rewards credit card, but instead of adding that one extra step and getting miles with this extra step, we're going to get we're going to get uninterrupted compound interest. So let me see if I can uh, paraphrase it just a little yeah. bit and. and terms that my mind digest it. Okay. So if I normally would borrow money to go buy a car, which is one of the most common things people go to buy, you know, um, that's a big ticket item. Normally I would go and get financed through Ford motor credit or get financed. Eventually it's going to roll up to the federal reserve bank, but somebody's going to handle that loan under your model. What you're saying is that, uh, you're bar you're basically borrowing from yourself. Correct. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, and so when that happens, you're still paying interest, but is that interest going back into your own account or your own pocket or how does that work? Well, yeah. we, we, we like to get technical, right? Cause there's a lot of misconceptions about infinite banking and really how it works. You have your cash value. We don't withdraw. We don't take the money from the policy. We take the money actually from the insurance company. And they use your policy as collateral. Since we're not using your money, we're using their money. There is going to be an interest component to it. 
So that interest is technically going to the insurance company. But since your cash value is still there, we never took it out. We just borrowed against it. Your money is your cash value is still compounding. It's still growing. So yeah. you are you are still paying an interest on the money you borrow. You're mm -hmm. just not uh, draining down the nest egg, so to speak. Correct. But you're also continuing to earn interest on the money that you have. So that's why we're not breaking the compound interest curve. And Tony, I'm willing to bet a lot of your clients, maybe even yourself, are paying cash for cars. Oh, yeah. We, yeah, we write checks for all the cars we buy. Okay. The, have the, for, uh, let's see, how long have we been doing that? I guess 20 years. Yeah. Which is great. I mean, uh, that and the advantages to that is you're not paying interest to anybody, right? You're, you're in control. Uh, the one downside is we're losing that opportunity cost on that money. And a lot of people say, well, I don't have a car payment because I pay cash. And I'd argue you kind of do. Because if you, you buy car one, you drain your account, you need to start saving up money for car number two. So whether you call it a savings or a car payment, that's still money that, that, that you're, that you are moving from one account to another. Yeah. And really with Nelson Nash's book, become your own banker, he actually uh, uses cars as an example. And we can actually show you the math by you saving the same amount of money instead of using saving that money in a bank. If you were to save it inside an infinite banking policy, you, you're going to have you're going to have more money more money at the end of the day because we never broke the compound interest curve. Yeah, I love the way you're saying that. And and I, this is one of the topics of personal finance I need to learn more yeah. about. Uh, how much? How long has the infinite banking concept been around now? Well, Nelson Nash wrote the book, Become Your Own Banker, in 2000 is when it was published. But he had personally been practicing many years before then. But uh, infinite banking, as far as just borrowing against a life insurance policy, uh, is really kind of that strategy, if you just narrow it down to the most basic level, has been around for last several hundred years, as long as the mutual insurance companies have been around. So a lot of them have been around for 150 years or more. And what I would tell you is that if you look, if you read, do some research on infinite banking and some of the practitioners of it is, you know, it's not Anthony and I telling you, this is a good idea. The, the biggest practitioners of this are actually banks, right? Is you can do read any book by Barry James Dyke. He's got a whole bunch of resources out there that actually documents how, how banks are doing it. You could Google it. If you type in Boley Bank on Life Insurance, you'll get 26, 27 million hits on that. And you can just run down that rabbit hole if you'd like. <laughs> One thing I think is interesting, like uh, banks, banks are the, the quintessential do as I say, not as I do. Because Wells Fargo alone has over 22 billion in cash value life insurance. That's where they're storing their money. And when you're storing it in the savings account, the bank has actually ended up storing it into a cash value life insurance. With infinite banking, what we're really doing is we are cutting out the middleman. We're cutting out the profits that the banks were doing. And a lot, because we talked about the Fed, the Federal Reserve, and there's a lot of people, and Nelson Nash included, was very concerned about the, about the Federal Reserve and their control to manipulate the economy. One way around that is the infinite banking concept will kind of stop the banks from using the fractional reserve banking, where the simplest terms, you can deposit $1, that, might, that will allow them to loan out nine. And so Nelson Nash is very prudent about being careful about doing business with, with banks and wanting to end, to end the Fed. And what he had said, if we can get 10% of the population to do infinite banking, that, 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 that could switch it. So maybe we, we could end the Fed. Well, that's, that's a worthwhile goal. I'll agree with that one for sure. So Tony, I was hey. going to add one other thing on there is the example that you gave us was uh, buying cars. And what I would say is kind of in our space, infinite banking space, if you do some research, there's going to be a whole bunch of 
people out there that are now starting to talk about financing cars and you can do that and you can make money doing it. But we're the first ones to tell you that I typically, we don't typically recommend that you're going to finance kind of a depreciating asset using a policy loan. This is much more suited and much more efficient if you take a loan against your policy to go buy a cash flowing or appreciating asset. And so that's why we typically talk about real estate a lot is because if you go buy a car, really what you're redirecting is the interest that you have sent to the bank inst banking institution. And at the end of it, you've got some residual value of just kind of the, the leftover uh, value in your car. If you take those same dollars and you go buy real estate, right, you've got appreciation, depreciation, you've got leverage that you're able to bring into it. Some people are fans, some aren't. But then also you've got cash flow that comes off of that asset that will pay that loan back. And so when you compare those two side by side, uh, you know, if you're looking to create wealth in a short period of time, you're much better suited by, by purchasing real estate or something else instead of a car. Yeah. yeah. I think that's a great principle is a better, a better use of your money, right? You need to buy more appreciating items with the money you earn versus depreciating items. That's how you build wealth. Let's, let's take that down one more level, Cameron, before we wrap up today, give, give the audience like a real tangible, practical walkthrough on what that might look like, like how you might use a cash flow policy or an infinite banking policy uh, to buy like your first piece of real estate. Cause a lot of people walk around and go, I'd love to get in real estate, but I can't afford it. Right. They don't, they don't, logically know the steps that it takes to, you know, make that first purchase uh, for passive income investment property. Yeah. Number one is first thing is we've got to uh, actually get money into a policy, right? So we've got to fund it. And the way that you do that is either through monthly contributions and or an annual contributions, which is like a lump sum or a combination of both. So once we've got cash value in there, now what you're going to do is you're just going to recall the insurance company up, request a loan against your cash value for the amount that's needed. That's going to come to you personally. You turn around and you personally go down and you put the 20, 25 grand down as a down payment on your rental property. Maybe it's got a, a fair market value of a hundred thousand and that purchase will kick off, you know, maybe 250 to $400 a month in cash flow. So let's call it 300. So now you've got $300 a month that's coming off in cash flow off of that asset. And you've got two places that you can direct that. Ideally, number one is you could send all that back to the policy to replenish that loan that you have against it. And or you can redirect a little bit of that to lifestyle if you need to or want to. But typically what we're having clients do is redirect all that 300 back to the insurance company to pay down that lien that you have against your cash value. Once you, if we fast forward and we get to the end of that loan, it's completely paid off. Now we've used our cash value to secure one cash flowing asset. And now all we're going to do is we're just going to turn around and go do the same thing over again. Awesome, you know, dude, Tony, one example that I'm, i I just have got a grandson, six months old and I want to stun the patriarch. I need to start teaching him about money. So we're getting him his own policy. I'm going to own it and control it. And when I get enough, I'm going to buy real estate. And so I'm going to borrow against his policy, buy a cash flowing asset. I'm going to use that cash flow to repay the policy. So when, when that loan is paid off, he's going to have one cash flowing property and using infinite banking, he still has his money continuing to compound. So then we're going to buy a second rental property. And now we have the cash flow from property one, cash flow from property two. So we could pay that policy loan off twice as fast. Then we're going to buy a third property. Now we can buy, pay it off in a third of the time. So the plan is by the time he graduates high school, he's going to have some options. If he wants to go to college, he can borrow the money to pay for his tuition but he's going to have to pay it back because I'm showing him that he needs to be accountable. Also, by that point, I need to run the numbers. I think you have six rental properties. So by the time he graduates college, if he chooses to go to, he's going to have six rental properties and he has a policy that we, I've, that I've been working with him to take over. And he's, then he's going to start paying the premiums. And he's going to pay the money back for his cost of his education. 
once he's proven to me that he can do that, then I'm going to gift him the properties and the policy. So what I've done from an early age, he's got a foundation of finance. He understands, he has some passive income coming in, but I'm going to make him work for it. Um, and then the goal is he needs to do the same thing to his grandson. And I'm teaching these principles uh, time and time again, but it's got to start somewhere. And I know there's a lot of people out there that like ourselves never got taught these principles, then it's our obligation that our kids will not say the same thing. We hope. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm still working on that, man. It takes a lot of work, doesn't it? So, well, guys, yeah. I really appreciate having you on the show. I'm looking forward. I'm, I need to have you guys get back on, uh, especially sometime next year when we uh, get through all this financial turmoil that I think is coming uh, through this uh, Evergrande. I don't know if you guys are following the Evergrande oh. thing, but I just uh, saw a thing, I think like three days or earlier this week, it's like two more uh, real estate companies in China that are having issues as well that may default. So it's it's starting to steamroll. And then I think differently than what happened in the U.S., um, you got a lot of companies like BlackRock and I think Vanguard have money in these Chinese companies. So uh, you've got the, I think the markets are going to be a little bit more intertwined with this deal than they were um, from outsiders being tied into the U.S. economy. You know, we'll see what happens. Right. But do you guys have any thoughts on that right now? Where do you think? Oh, it's going? yeah. Ironically, right <laughs> after this, we're shooting a podcast what to do when this recession hits. I mean, you look back and there's a recession literally every 10 years. Like clockwork, right? Like, except for the last 12, uh, for some reason, there's been in one literally every decade, except for, uh, except for the last decade. And Robert Kiyosaki just announced uh, two weeks ago, we're going to have the biggest crash we've ever seen in October. So who, know, who knows if the, it's going to be October, but you look at historically, you look at the price of assets, the fundamentals behind them were due for a recession. And what I'm more concerned about, one of the strategies, again, I'm, uh, we're a big free market. We don't like to want the government to get out of, uh, out, out of the system. But unfortunately, they're all they're all up in it, and they're they're, they're two biggest uh, tools to fight the recession is lowering interest rates and lowering taxes. We screwed up over this was in this recovery. We lowered taxes and interest rates are at an all time low. They're not going to have the tools that they created to help spur this economy. So I believe that this could take longer to get out of. Yeah. I'm a big believer too, that, uh, you know, when you look at the the gas prices and, you know, they're up a what 50% just in the, you know, last three months, I don't know where they are with you guys, but when you start looking at the impact that that has on a family that's driving back and forth to work, I mean, you're literally taking billions and billions of dollars out of the economy and putting it right into fuel costs. Um, oh, yeah. and, and that's got to have a major impact. Um, you know, and I think under Trump, it, uh, they were less than $2 a gallon on regular. And then now it's up over, you know, at three or over, over three, sometimes it hits three forty here, uh, where I'm at. And, uh, that's just, that's got to have a major impact. And then, you know, of course, inflation is just pulling money right out of the economy. But, uh, I, I do agree with you guys. I do think, uh, we're headed towards, uh, at least a little bit of financial turmoil. I hope people are getting ready for it. Yeah. yeah. But Tony, one thing we want is we don't have a scarcity mindset. I, if some of these things are going to happen, th that's when it's important for us to prepare. If we can be in a situation where just like those people that I mentioned who bought your neighbor's house for 50 cents in the dollar, those people were ready. They had some liquidity they were ready for those opportunities. So we got some time, the time's getting short, but if you can be prepared for this, in these recessions, a lot of people get hurt, but there's a lot of people who actually grow their wealth. That's the time to buy, to buy assets. Assets are gonna be on sale because I believe 
as a, our economy, we overreact. Right? right now, I think the stock market's overreacting. You look at the jobs, the fundamentals, the, the profitability of companies. I don't think they support the value. But I agree. This can create opportunities. Our economy has a tendency to overreact. On good news, we are buying more. And just like, I think some of these equities, their, their share price does not substantiate the fundamentals of the, uh, of the company. That's because we're overreacting because things are good. We have a tendency to overreact when things are bad as well. So we're going to overreact in these assets are going to be undervalued. And that's, that creates an opportunity to grow our wealth. So we're telling our clients, don't be scared of this recession. I mean, these are going to happen. You know, what we need to do is make sure we're in a position to take advantage of these upcoming opportunities. Yeah, I love it. I, and I agree with that. You got to be ready. Um, and I think Robert Kiyosaki talks about that a lot too, is like things are on sale, like bam, it's time for the sale to, to be on. But uh, how do you guys, uh, thanks for being on the show today, Cameron and yeah. Anthony. How do people find out more about the infinite banking? You guys sound like a great resource for that, especially around when it comes to strategies about picking up real estate property using that concept. Yeah, they can find us at infinitewealthconsultants.com. And uh, there we've got everything, all of our contact info and uh, videos and everything else, additional resources. Yeah, wonderful. I think it's so critical. It's one of the millionaire key number three I teach is get money smart. You know, you've got to take time, just like you learn about math and this is in science. Mm -hmm. You've got to take time to learn about money. If you want to be good with money, you got to learn about money. And uh, it's not just one principle or one thing. You got to, you know, branch out, learn about all the different things that personal finance can offer and, uh, and make an effort. And that's how you uh, build wealth. Absolutely. Thanks for having us on, Tony. The Millionaire Choice Show shares the opinions and experiences of people and should not be considered financial advice. Before making your own financial choices, please seek out a registered financial advisor or certified financial planner.